you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah we're, we're dead asleep. We don't care. Hey, 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 good morning. Just humor me. Thank you. You humor me. I appreciate it. You guys are looking at an old school Southside Christian school letterman jacket. It looks like it's from the 60s, but I assure you it's not. Uh, as you can tell, I played a lot of sports. I was really good. I got a lot of awards right here. Just kidding. I'm terrible at athletics. I don't even know why I have one of these, but I really wanted one. But it has my name on it to prove that it's mine, even though I hardly played any athletics at South Bay Christian School. That's pretty cool, huh? One clap. Thank you. All right. That's awesome. Thank you. One clap. Okay. Hey. How's everyone feeling this morning? We feel awake, we feel good, ready to hear from the Lord? Okay, good. Let me introduce myself, let me tell you a little bit about my story before we jump into Isaiah chapter 1, where we're going to be hanging out. Uh, my name is Tim Wadsworth, I went to school here from 1991 and then graduated in 2003. 2003. I'm old, I just turned 30, okay? When I used to get out of bed in my 20s, I would do cartwheels. Now I get out of bed and I go... In the world hurts, right? Like things really start to fall apart. Right around you hit 30, and then you people in your 40s and 50s and 60s, I don't even know how you guys do it. It's just, it's downhill from here. But I graduated in 2003, and uh, I took three years off after high school, and I poured in a rock and roll band. I really did. I, I didn't know where I wanted to go to school, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I was really good at drums. Uh, I went to the Fine Arts Center. Uh, all four years of high school, so it was really cool to be able to hang out over at, well, the Fine Arts Center when I went there was in downtown Greenville. Now it's right next to Wade Hampton High School. But I went there all four years, and so I knew I wanted to do music, and so I hung out there uh, all four years of high school, and then uh, had the opportunity to go and tour and kind of fulfill my dream, and then I realized that that was kind of boring, and it was not everything that it lived up to. And uh, that was about the time I gave my life to Jesus. So I wanted to go to the best school in the world. So I went to Liberty University. Raise your hand if you know where Liberty University is. That's right. Home of the Flames. Why in the world they call it the Flames? But they are. We are the Flamers. And uh, I went there from 2005 to 2010. And that's where I got my degree. Uh, I am now a pastor at North Hills Community Church. I don't know where North Hills Community Churches and Taylors. Miss Corey does. That's right. Miss Corey, you were teaching when I was here. Wow. And you look the exact same. Like, you don't age at all. Like, you go into a machine and you sleep in it, and it helps you not age at all. Unbelievable. And then Miss Loper is here. Where's Lori Loper? Yeah. Right. I mean, these are legends. These are Southside legends. Miss Corey and Miss Loper. We called her Sin Evil Repo. That's Miss Lori Loper backwards. I don't even know how I still remember that. But that's what I took from my private school education. I remember Sin Evil Repo. Is her name backwards. And then is Miss Barrett still here? Okay, here's a fun story about Miss Barrett. Uh, my sophomore year, I took French, obviously, with Miss Barrett. I did really well. I got a D. I did really, really well. I got a D. Hey, D's and C's get degrees. At least I thought so. Uh, Miss Barrett made me take it again at the beginning of my junior year. Same class, same curriculum, same everything. I got it. How is that even possible? There, I should have a plaque out in the mall area with my name on it saying, what an idiot. And then my picture. It's like that. Yeah, I took French. I got a D my junior year. Sophomore year, took it again my junior year. and got a F. I, I bought a record here. That should be on my letterman jacket. Old pin. Right there. But anyway, we went to Liberty University, and I'm a pastor over at North Hills. Nathan Wessel, the good-looking kid, the beaver haircut, or the old-school beaver haircut, he's in my youth group, uh, a live student ministry we meet on Sunday night. Uh, our mission statement is just to help students find and follow Jesus. So I've been in North Hills now. This summer will be six years. Six years. Uh, it's crazy. Let me introduce my family to you. There should be some pictures. The first one, yeah, this is my family. Uh, that's my smoking hot wife, that's Rachel. I love her, she's awesome. And then that's my, well he was one and a half in that picture, now he's two and a half. His name is Judah. Uh, if you meet Judah, he will throat punch you. He's one of the most craziest, got so much energy, he doesn't know what to do with it, so we're in the phase where he punches, right? And it's two, like two year olds have claws for hands. It doesn't matter how much you cut their fingernails, they will draw blood on you. They get excited, they're like, like, Judah, 
Like right, losing eyeballs. It's, it's crazy. So that's Judah. He is the apple of my eye. I love that kid. And then the next picture is Levi. Levi is, uh, he's going to be due May 29th. That's my second son. Uh, yeah. Uh, I haven't met him yet. When I do, uh, I'll let you know kind of what he's like, and maybe I'll check that in. I hear my world's going to be rocked going from one child to two. Is that true, parents? In here, no? Yeah? People who don't have kids? you got to love that. It's funny, the people that don't have kids love to always give your, you know, their opinion on parenting. And the parents really don't. It's hilarious. Before we had kids, everyone's like, oh, your life's going to work. Your life's going to suck. I'm like, really? No. How many kids do you have? Oh, I don't have any kids. <laughs> oh, good. Thanks for your two cents. Appreciate that. So... That's kind of my story. Um, I'm so excited to be here, obviously because I'm an alumni. But here's my goal in the next 20 minutes. It seems like a lot, but it's not. Here's my goal with you guys. I don't want to speak Christianese to you. Everyone know how to speak Christianese? You're a private school uh, kiddo, so everyone put your hand in the air. Does everyone here know how to... Put them up! Everyone here knows how to speak Christianese. Okay? Let me show you a little bit of Christianese. You ready? I'm going to do my favorite prayer, and I'm going to, I'm going to say God's name at least 50 times. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you, God, for Jesus, Lord, Heavenly Father, God, creation of the world, Lord Jesus, thank you for the, right? Like Christianese, we know how to pray, where someone who's not in Jesus would be like, you're speaking a different language, what does that mean? Right? So like the last thing I want to do is just come before you and speak Christianese. Like I want to get down on your level. We're going to open up God's word and we're going to see what the spirit has to say to you. Because my goal, listen, my goal is not just to come here and just do another chapel. That's not what you need. It's not what I need. It's not what the teachers here need. Our goal is to not just go through a religious ritual. And you get really good at that in a private school. Right? Like, I know how to speak Christianese. I made everyone around me think that I was in Jesus because I heard other people speak like that. And I was like, oh, good. Like, I won't get in trouble if I speak like that. And then when I left Southside and I went home, I lived however I wanted. And when no one was looking, right? Like, I, I, I lived to build Tim Wadsworth's kingdom and not God's kingdom. Like, everyone here, you know how to go through the motions. And Satan loves to do this stuff. He loves to deceive us. Satan wants you to think that everything's going a certain way because you're just going through the motions. And that's going to save you. Or that's going to make people think highly of you. Or whatever it is. So, so my goal this morning is for this not to be just 20 minutes that we fill for the sake of filling. But like to look at the next 20 minutes to know that God is with us. His word says that we're two or more are gathered. Like he is in our presence. He is in our midst. That's, that's an amazing thing. And for some of you, that's old news. Like, you don't care because you've heard it every day and your heart has become a little bit callous towards that. Like, I don't think you guys are going to realize how awesome it is that you go to a Christian school until you're probably into your 30s and your 40s and you look back and say, wow. That, that's pretty amazing that I was able to go to a school that wanted to push me closer to Jesus. Like that, that's amazing. And there are kids all throughout the upstate of South Carolina, United States, the world, that would die to be in your position. And some of you are just flushing it down the toilet. I know I was one. A lot of that, man, I just flushed it down the toilet. I didn't care. But hopefully by God's grace, this morning, he's going to open up our eyes to what he has to say uh, to us from Isaiah chapter 1. So if you have God's word, hold it up in the air. God's word, good. Hold it up if you have it on your phone. You know, I don't know how to have phones. Can I have phones? No? Oh, he went. <laughs> okay, that's okay. Do we have uh, the Samuel L. Jackson voice on Bible Gateway to read it? Or do I need to read it? <laughs> You have what? Yeah, I did it. Yeah, let, let's, let's read it. Isaiah chapter 1, we're going to be looking at verses 4 through 20. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 20. Turn in your Bibles or uh, turn your attention to the screen. Ah, sinful nation. A people named the name of Jesus. 
offspring of evil doers, children who deal corruptly. They have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. Why will you still be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel? The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but bruises and sores and raw wounds. They are not pressed out or bound up or softened with oil. Your country lies desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. In your very presence, foreigners devour your land. It is desolate as overthrown by foreigners. And the daughter of Uzziah is like a booth in a vineyard, like a lodge in a cucumber field, like a besieged city. If the Lord of hosts had not left us a few survivors, we should have been like Sodom and become like Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations, I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fathers, plead the widow's cause. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Awesome. Okay, so those 16 verses are super, super packed. So my goal this morning is to break this up into three different sections and then ask, how can we apply this to 2016, the freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors, um, when you leave here, to ask the Spirit to do a work in your heart. So let me give you a little background information of what's going here in Isaiah chapter 1. You've got the prophet Isaiah. Everybody say Isaiah. Isaiah. Here's why I love Isaiah. The Bible's right here. Some of you maybe know this. Maybe some of you don't. Chances uh, are you probably don't. And your homework assignment is by the time I leave this building, you can tell me why Isaiah did this. I have a gift card in my pocket for you. Isaiah is a prophet of the Bible who walked around naked for three years. I kid you not, it's in the Bible. Your homework assignment is to come to me and tell me why, what was the purpose of Isaiah's obedience in walking around naked for three years. But you've got this prophet. Kind of an awkward transition. But you've got this prophet, his name is Isaiah, okay? And then we've got God's people, okay, the Israelites, are divided into two nations. Okay, you've got Israel, and then you've got Judah, okay? Everyone say Judah. That's going to be really easy to remember. My son's name is Judah. Okay, you already have a little pot belly. Kids are already calling him Buddha. It's not good. Okay, pray for Judah. It's sad. Yeah, he was dealt some pretty bad genes for me. So, you've got Judah, okay? And then you've got Israel, and you've got Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. And then you've got these guys way up north called the Assyrians. Everyone say Assyrians. Okay, very cool. They're bad name and chance. Okay, the Assyrians don't mess. Okay, you don't want to mess with the Assyrians. Then, you've got God. Everyone knows who he is. Uppercase G. Everybody say God. God. Okay, so these are the four people that we're going to look at. We're going to look at the background information of Isaiah chapter 1. And you've got Israel, who's just doing what is right in their own eyes. They're living in sin. Okay? And God has warned them over and over and over again what the destruction of sin does and what that looks like. 
And then God starts to deal swiftly with Israel. Okay? He lets the Assyrians from up north, and this is around 8th century BC. Okay, what does BC stand for? Alright, right. Right, BC, he lets these Assyrians come down south and just own the Israelites. They were protected when they walked in obedience, but because of their sin, God deals swiftly with that. God judges that. And so destruction came upon Israel. So that's why God sent Isaiah to go to the nation, or excuse me, the yeah, nation of Judah and to be a mouthpiece for God. That's what prophets did. They're a mouthpiece for God. And so Isaiah goes to Judah and goes, hey guys, wake up. Look what is happening in Israel. If we don't repent and turn back to the Lord, this same destruction is going to come upon us. And here's what's so different about the two nations. Like, the, the, uh, in Israel, like, they turned from God bad and didn't even try and hide it. Like, they were rebellious, and they just did it unapologetically. But then you had, like, Judah, who was still living in sin, but still tried to trick people like they were living for the Lord, and still went through their religious rituals, but still, like, denied God with their actions and their thoughts, and they were teetering on being just like Israel. So Isaiah goes over there and says, guys, wake up. Like, you don't understand the destruction that is coming upon your doorstep because you're rejecting God. Guys, there's only one type of person that I believe is in hell today. It's not just like a murderer or a thief or there's certain people that hell is dedicated for. Like, hell is just dedicated to people who just reject Jesus. Even if they were a good person, lived a good life, if they reject Jesus then the Bible has something to say about that, where Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man enters heaven but through Jesus. It doesn't matter how talented you are, or how good-looking you are, or how popular you are, that does not save you. It doesn't matter how popular you are, because you're going to leave here, and you're probably going to keep in touch with two or three people, okay, and then go to a brand new place where you have to start over, and you're going to be a nobody. Let's pray. I'm just kidding. No, but that's like really sobering for us. So, so we've got this going on with Israel and Judah, and they're living in sin, and then God is allowing the Assyrians to come down and bring this destruction upon them because of unrepentant sin. And you've got Isaiah going to Judah and saying, look, this religious ritual stuff is not cutting it. Repent, turn to the Lord. So do we kind of understand the background of what's going on in Isaiah chapter 1? Because here's what we're going to see. We're seeing this broken into three sections. Number one, the first few verses, which is verses four through nine, we're seeing very, a very big confrontation going on. God is coming. He's calling them out. There's confrontation. Have you ever had to call someone out? And when I call people out, like my lip quivers. Hey, you. Stop. Right? Like I get scared. Like I don't like confrontation. I'd rather just be friends and hug and high five, right? I don't like confrontation, but we're seeing that going on. The second part of the 16 verses is we're seeing fake worship. Fake worship. And then the third part, we are seeing incredible grace from the Lord. And so here's the big idea. Like, this is the main reason why I think Isaiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 20 were written. And this is for you. If you're a note taker, write this down. You get in the car and you talk to your parents or your friends and they say, what in the world did Tim Wadsworth even talk about? Like, what was the big idea of his sermon? Here's the big idea, okay? The sin of God's people repeatedly stood in the way of their relationship with him. And we're seeing that. There's normally a pattern that you see and it breaks down into four sections in scripture. Number one, you see that people just sin. They don't care. They just do whatever they want. And then number two, we see that God deals swiftly with sin. God doesn't turn a blind eye to it. And then number three, they repent. And number four, you see incredible grace. And so that's kind of the big idea. This is what I want to talk to you guys about for the last eight minutes that I have. Is the sin of God's people repeatedly stood in the way of their relationship with him. And so here's something that I really want to press to you guys. And I want you to start thinking. God's patience doesn't mean permission. Let that kind of sink.
thing then. God's patience with you doesn't mean permission. And there's many of you here, you're living however you want, addicted to whatever sin under the sun, doing your thing, and there's no confrontation going on. Like, life is good. Why do I need a Savior? I'm good. I go home, mommy and daddy pay for everything. I got a sweet car that I did nothing to earn. And you have a really sweet car and your parents paid for it? That's what I think of you. I had to drive a piece of junk Ford Ranger that broke down every day out here in this parking lot. But, I, but God loves you. That's awesome. Well done for your BMW. I have no resentment or bitterness at all. But like, listen, especially for like that chick that's sleeping right there and homeboy over here that's sleeping with his letterman jacket on. Hey, homeboy. Everyone look at homeboy right there with his letterman jacket. Say, hey, Frank! Wake up! Well, I'm cool with my letterman jacket. Yeah, we get it. So listen, I'll get my letterman jacket out. It's better than yours. So listen, Back up here. God's patience doesn't mean permission. And for some of you, life is fine. You don't see any confrontation. Like, why turn to the Lord? You're going to do what's right in your eyes, and everything's good. I'm going to continue to live this way, because I think for some reason, God just doesn't see my sin. Up here. Like, God doesn't see my sin. And I'm here to tell you, He does. There's nothing you can do to trick God there's nothing you can do to manipulate him. Just because you're maybe you're talented or you're good at something or you're well liked, like that doesn't forgive you of your sin. Just because you go to Southside Christian School doesn't make you a Christian. Just because you claim Christianity doesn't mean you're following Jesus. And I have a great saying. I don't even know if we're allowed to use this word around here, but, but here it is. Crap or get off the pot. Thank you. I was waiting for the gas. <laughs> Listen, guys, either you follow Jesus or you don't. This isn't a game. And for some of you, you claim Jesus, but you don't live like it. Some of you, you claim Jesus. I'm losing my microphone. Get on there. Some of you claim Jesus, but you're following and worshiping something else. And so I just want to encourage you. Like, my personality is get off the fence. If you claim Jesus, follow him. Read his word. Take advantage of being at a Christian school. If not, confess it. And don't try and be fake and just go through the motions. That drives me nuts. And it's a horrible way to live. And I live like that. Elementary school, middle school, and high school here. I claim Jesus, but man, I denied him with my heart. My prayer for you is that you actually realize that you do need a Savior. And that Jesus loves you a lot. And came to give you life. So going back to the confrontation part, uh, kind of one of my points that I want you guys to chew on is this. A sinful heart produces confrontation with the Lord. The Israelite sin produced a barrier between them and God. If you're living in sin, there is a barrier between you and God. If you live in sin, unapologetically, unrepentant sin, there's a barrier to that. Why? Because God is holy. He is set apart. There's none like him. He's the opposite of sin. He's a just God. And so we have to know that, that a sinful heart produces confrontation with the Lord. And here's what Satan wants to happen to you. He wants your heart to get really, really callous. Um, I do CrossFit. I know I don't look like I do CrossFit, but I do Southern Moon CrossFit. Dave Schwarz and Hudson Fricky. Yeah, they graduated from here. They opened up an awesome gym. Hudson looks like a gladiator. I'm going to look like Hudson Fricky. But we do these things called pull-ups, okay? But they teach us how to kip pull-ups. Everyone know what a kipping pull-up is? Do it in PE class. You will be the man. And uh, so they teach you how to do these pull-ups really, really inefficiently. It's awesome. You don't use a lot of energy. But here's the deal. Your hands will rip. Because you're gripping that bar and you're twisting it to throw your body up over the bar over and over and over again. And there was one time I was doing uh, pull-ups and I could feel blood running down my wrist. It hurts. But here's the really cool thing. After your hands heal, they become callous. And I can get my hands up on there and do this all day. Nothing's going to happen. It's like sandpaper. My wife hates it. She holds my hand. She's like, ah, gross. I don't even want to hold your hand anymore. Because they just feel nasty. But for some of us, our hearts are callous. You've been living in sin so long, it's like, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? I'm just going to keep doing this. And so for you, if your heart is callous, man, my prayer is that God would just come in 
and just break your heart. And then point number two, verses 10 through 17, we're saying that a sinful heart promotes fake worship from the Lord. A sinful heart promotes fake worship from the Lord. I've got three minutes, and I want to end with this. And I have so much more that I want to preach, but I've got to get you guys to class. Yeah, I've got to get you to class, I know. So looking at point number two about a sinful heart, how it promotes fake worship to the Lord, here's something really sobering, and here's something that's really awesome. God doesn't need you. God doesn't depend on you. And if, you, and if I were to die tomorrow, the gospel is going to flourish. When God looks at me, he's not happy that I went to a private school. When God looks at me, he's not happy that I'm a pastor. He doesn't go, wow, Tim, you're so cool. Look at what you do. Hooray. No. But here's what's amazing. If you're in Jesus, when God looks at you, he is very well pleased because he sees his son. There's nothing you bring to the table that's going to make God love you more, love you less, or any of that garbage. Because when he looks at you, he sees Jesus. Females, listen to me. You don't need a guy to find your worth in. Find your worth in Jesus. Hey guys, you don't need to be the best at a sport or an instrument or be cool to find your worth. Is your identity wrapped in the person of Jesus? So when God looks at you, he is very well pleased because he sees his son. And so when we go through the motions of fake worship, God is not pleased by that. When you go back and read this passage, um, God is even saying, like, hey, look, these, these offerings that you bring, that's an abomination to me. Because we know Old Testament, they had to bring, like, a goat or a pigeon or something for that shed blood to be the atonement of their sin for a little bit of time. And they had to do these burnt offerings, and it's really gross. Like, I'm glad I don't have to bring a cow to be slaughtered to forgive me of my sins. Why? Because Jesus came. He is the propitiation of our sin. Our atonement is wrapped up in the person of Jesus because of his spilled blood for you. So if you're saved, that's it. One time. One time shed blood. Romans says, call upon the name of the Lord you shall be saved. No more fake worship. God is saying, your burnt offerings to me, I don't want them. That's an abomination to me. It's kind of like if you were to tithe, and you were really pissed that you had to put that check in the offering plate. God doesn't need your money. God cares about your heart. And that's what I'm going to finish. 10 20. God cares about your heart. Students, I love you guys so, so much. My goal and my prayer for you is you don't just go through religious rituals for the sake of where you go to school. We good? Nod your head if you heard something, some nugget of truth that you're going to take with you. Cool. I'm going to pray for us and I'm going to get you to class. God, thank you so much for Jesus. God, thank you that you have made a bridge for us to be reconciled to you. And that was through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So that we no longer have to have a sinful heart, and we no longer have to go through the rituals of fake worship. God, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you for saving us. May we leave here changed by your Spirit, challenged by your Spirit, and ultimately empowered by your Spirit. God, I love this school. I love these students. Continue to have your hand of blessing over it. It's in the name of Jesus that I pray. Amen. Love you guys. Have fun at the school. Don't perform.